is Kristen Lays, and I'm with Heritage Preservation. And Heritage Preservation has been hosting the Connecting to Collections online community uh, starting this summer. And it's a project we're doing with the Institute of Museum and Library Services in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History. And as you heard from Mike, um, Learning Times is an organization that's helping us with the design and production of the website and also these webinars. Um, so before we get started, just to um, just to get it, just let maybe some more people join. I'm gonna put out a poll about how you heard about today's event. Um, just wanting to see what we might do to to encourage more attendance in, in these, and we're gonna we're starting to do some evaluation. We've had this is our fourth webinar event with an expert, and um, we're planning more as we go into the fall. So look for for information about that to come. But just wanted to sort of see how people are finding out about us. So we'll leave that poll up for just a second. But uh, it's been a great opportunity. The online community has now over 470 members, which is great. And we are planning um, a more extensive um, PR campaign at the end of the month. And so we, we welcome you to tell colleagues about it. Looks like you're already sharing information. and. Um, have maybe participated in one of our previous events, so we encourage you to do that. You can also join um, the Connecting to Collections Online Community Facebook page if that's an easier way for you to get sort of quick reminders or um, hear what's going on. Um, that's another way to hear about us. Well, great. Well, thanks for participating participating in that poll. We will take all of that into advisement, um, and then just a little icebreaker, so to speak. Um, Today we're talking about photo cold storage, and probably it's pretty hot where you are across the country, um, except for maybe our participant from Juneau, Alaska. Um, just curious what kind of ice cream you like. Not that you're going to be storing it in the same freezer as your photographs. Please don't do that. But uh, just a little icebreaker to see how we all so we're coming across the country, see how we all might compare to one another. Boy, strawberry just can't get any votes. Oh yeah, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Seeing a lot. I'm originally hail from Atlanta. I see a lot of other Atlanta colleagues on the line. Maybe peach is an option for them. And for, frankly, I tend to go for some pretty exotic Ben and Jerry's type flavors myself. So, well, thanks. Um, well, without further ado, um, I think I will start our featured presentation today. And um, again, this is the Connecting to Collections online community. And the goal of the community is just to help smaller institutions, libraries, archives, and historical societies uh, quickly locate reliable preservation resources and have a chance to network with their colleagues. Um, we're drawing on a lot of the resources that the Connecting to Collections initiative that IMLS um, initiated. And that was included an online bookshelf of resources. And you'll find on the website all sorts of links to that. Um, and then every other, uh, about every other week or so, we've been having a featured resource. So obviously, today's featured resource is the National Park Service's Cold Storage um, online video series. And it's a, a guide to long-term preservation um, for, for photographic materials. And you can uh, set your settings on the online community so that you'll get updates when, when that featured resource changes or when we have discussion topics. Um, so look under that Help button if you need some assistance in knowing how to change your settings for the site. Uh, keep an eye out on our calendar for upcoming webinar events. And we also will post things that we think are of interest to the community, such as upcoming workshops or grant deadlines or other such items. If you have something you would like to share with the community and post on the calendar, you're, you're welcome to email us through our contact link. Uh, so feel free to do that. And today, we are very fortunate to be joined with uh, at, by Teresa Vollinger. She is a paper and photographic conservator from the National Park Service's Harper's Ferry Center. She stars in their cold storage video series. And you may have been familiar with it for a while. Um, you may have seen her there. 
And um, we're just very happy to have her today. This is part of a partnership, actually, that the online community has going with the National Park Service. There's so many excellent resources that they've developed for their staff and for their entire network across the country. And the rest of us who are not affiliated with the Park Service are so fortunate that they make these things available free and online, and that so many archives can benefit from this great information, and this resource is no exception. So um, again, this is uh, just a screenshot of the resource we're featuring right now and the URL. Uh, you can watch it um, in the flash version, or if for whatever reason that's um, not possible on your computer, there's a non-flash version. But the flash version is great because this can be a bit intimidating to sort of understand how to package, store, monitor, and access photographic materials in cold storage. And just having some simple presentations on how to is, I think, such a great way to, to really come to grips with this um, topic. But we are so fortunate to have Teresa with us. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you, Kristen. And um, as Mike said, in that left-hand um, box in the Q&A, you can go ahead and type in any questions you have for Teresa on this topic. Um, but otherwise, I will get started with just some, some general questions that I had as I was reviewing the resource. So Teresa, I mean, maybe this is really obvious, um, but your website makes clear that only film materials are suitable for cold storage. So I'm assuming then any kind of taste tape-based materials like videotape or audio tape, that's not appropriate for the kind of cold storage you're discussing here. Yeah, that's right, Kristen. Um, we actually developed um, this project specifically for film-based photographic materials, although other, other types of photographic materials can also benefit. Um, but just for the Park Service standpoint, that's specifically what it was um, organized and developed around. Um, but materials um, that are magnetic media don't do so well in a frozen state. Uh, there hasn't, just hasn't been enough research on it quite yet um, in terms of the magnetic tape itself and the other components that make up the cassette itself, the plastic, some metal components. So it's not really advised for those type of materials. And um, in the website, um, there are a couple of pages which kind of outline what you can identify in your collections that are best stored in cold storage. Great. Do you want to you just outline a couple of examples of them, like the most common that just pretty much everyone would probably have in their institution? Sure. Um, any of your film-based materials, which would be negatives, um, black and white and color negatives, um, Mostly things, we focus on things that are our cellulose acetate. Um, cellulose nitrate negatives should also be in cold storage, um, but they have really specific requirements because of their flammability. Um, so those need another level of storage environments in terms of the type of freezer that you choose and how you handle them. Um, so your, your regular black and white negatives, 4x5, 35 millimeter film, um, slides. Slides are particularly important because slides are almost one of those things that's a double whammy, so to say, um, because their film base is cellulose acetate and their color. So they have two things. Their film base isn't very stable and their color, which I'm sure all of you who have slides at home <laughs> Um, from you know, 20, 30 years ago have noticed color shift in them. Um, not all of them, depending on the type of film. But, um, so slides are very important. And I know almost every collection I've ever seen has some sort of slides. OK, great. And so you, on the site, I think it's, they do a great job in sort of outlining some strategies on how to identify the type of film you mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. So basically, it seems like that the age of the material is a good guideline for trying to understand exactly what you might have. Um, it is, and it isn't. You can make a divide on um, manufacture sometimes of, uh, especially the cellulose nitrate that kind of went out of manufacture in the early 1950s. Um, but some people were still using it. They'd have old batches of film, and they're not going to throw it away, so they would still use it. Um, so it's a combination of, like you said, age and a combination of just visual appearance. 
Um, things you can look for are identified on our site, um, different edge markings. Um, some edge markings were put there for the use of the photographer. Um, some were put there to, to solely identify the film, and you can read on right on the edge. It'll say safety film or nitrate. Um, nitrate would be the cellulose nitrate film, which is older film, and that's the one that has some flammability issues. Um, and then they eventually developed the cellulose acetate film, or quote unquote safety film, because they realized that early on. They realized that there were issues with this film. Um, and that's why early on, and I think it was captured recently in a movie, I can't remember the name of it, but um, they show a fire in a film house. Um, and that happened um, because of the flammability characteristics of nitrate. And it, it tends to ignite at a fairly low temperature. It can ignite at like 120 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, somebody's attic can be that warm. <laughs> and especially right, right now on the East Coast. <laughs> yeah. I think so, that was that, uh, Cinema Paradiso? Yes, yes, it was in that. And um, the, the, the fires are very hard to put out um, because cellulose nitrate, when it burns, it produces its own oxygen. So it, it, you can throw it in a bucket of water and it still can burn. So that's what's so dangerous wow. about it and why it's considered, uh, considered a hazardous material. Right. Now, does the site go into detail on uh, cellulose nitrate and, and the specifics? As you said, there's another sort of set of considerations when storing that? Um, Do you all get into that much? Yeah, it goes into it a little bit. It kind of just, um, because this project was designed around our acetate films, um, the Park Service a few years back had taken care of a lot of its nitrates. Um, and what we had done with a lot of those, because they were in serious need, is do duplication and digitization of those. Right. Um, so this more focuses on cellulose acetate, but in terms of how to store it, but it, it does go into identification characteristics of each one. Um, each one does deteriorate in a different way, um, and they're very distinct on how they deteriorate. And so on the website, there's some great visuals that just show you, OK, this is what serious cellulose acetate deterioration looks like. This is what serious cellulose nitrate deterioration looks like. Um, so I think that helps a lot, because sometimes you don't know the year of the film. Or sometimes it doesn't have edge marking that you can tell what type of film it is, and you want to be able to store it properly. Um, and but luckily, when it comes to film, unlike other branches of photography, um, it's pretty simple in terms of your choices for film base because there is only the cellulose acetate, cellulose nitrate, and then more recently developed in the 1960s polyester. So um, it's nice that it's simple and clean like that, that there's only a few choices anyways. Right. Um, and, and all of those are identified and the differences in them. Um, the polyester film-based material is fairly stable. And so if you have a black and white um, 4 by 5 negative, often in museums um, that is a copy negative or an inner positive that you get made for an archival copy. And that's very stable, because your film base is stable, and the black and white is stable, because you won't have a problem with fading. Um, so those type of materials are, are the one thing in the film world and, and photographic film world that really doesn't need cold storage. It's pretty stable in your normal archival environment. Great. That's good to know. Sure. Yeah, I, think, I think most people, I think the word has basically gotten out to most people about um, so this nitrate, I guess the fear that I've seen sometimes in discussions is that people will panic when they, if they realize they have a collection, sometimes, you know, destroy it right. unnecessarily or, I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, it's very important to, to address carefully. So what you would say if, if, you, if you're worried about it, um, you should contact a, cons a photo conservator first? I mean, I've heard people say, well, call the fire department or, or what have you. Um, but, you know, is that maybe taking it a little too far yeah. too fast? I think so, probably. It doesn't have, I mean, especially if it's in a controlled environment, um, if it's in, you know, museum storage already, and depending how much you have. You know, if you only have 10 4x5s compared to 4,000 4x5s, 
um, you know, then you have something you have to think about if you have the, the latter end of that scale. Right. Um, but if there's only a few, it's you know, it's it's just a, it's just an awareness. It's just to be aware that you have it and that you can take special precautions if you need to, and to kind of know what those are. Right. Um, so. Okay. Well, great. Um, I see we have a question that's come in, and again. Yeah. To the participants, feel free on, in the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen. If you have any questions for Teresa, feel free to, to pipe up. Um, and Carolyn in Florida said, if you freeze photographs of vinegar syndrome, will it slow or halt the process? That's a great question, Carolyn. And um, is everyone online? I can just kind of ask. I don't know if I can do a quick poll or whatever, or just have people think about um, if people know uh, of vinegar syndrome or have um, heard of it or have experienced it in their collections. And um, Carolyn, that's something that um, happens pretty much um, early on as cellulose acetate film starts to deteriorate. And it's a really good indicator that your collection is right on that edge of starting the deterioration process. Because that's, that's kind of the first thing that happens before cellulose acetate starts to deform um, or starts to distort in any manner, you start to get that smell. And you open a box, and literally, for people who aren't aware of it, it, it smells like vinegar. You will know <laughs> when you open that box um, that something is going on. And when you have that, you really want to consider cold storage um, very soon for those type of collections, because they are starting. And yes, it will slow it down. It will not halt the process but it will slow it down. And that's one of the reasons that we do cold storage. It's the only thing that we can find that's going to, going to slow down uh, with any success, um, any sort of deterioration process. Um, there are some great resources on the Im Image Permanence Institute website. Um, and I think Kristen was going to maybe refer to that later um, in terms of time frame and gain of longevity of film, um, that cold storage versus just keeping it in normal um, environmental conditions for museums. Um, so that's a great reference. I mean, it could add hundreds of years of life to your film, even if it's at the stage where it has vinegar syndrome. And um, it seems from the research that IPI have done that once the vinegar syndrome starts, Deterioration starts kind of rapidly increasing. If, if you looked at a graph of it, of deterioration process in film, it'll be trucking along nicely in normal conditions for about 40, 50 years or so. And then all of a sudden, when you get to that one point where it starts to deteriorate, the graph will just go up at a steep angle. And it will be a matter of you know, 5, 10 years, if it's not taken care of, that um, deterioration will increase that much. And so if you have discovered it, you open that drawer, and mm -hmm. as, as someone once said to me, it smelled like dill pickles. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> is, there, is there any hope for duplicating those materials at that point? I mean, to put Absolutely. The OK. So it's still it's not harmful to, to try to duplicate it? Mm -hmm. or, okay. No. Mm -mm. Absolutely. It's, and actually, that's a Really good point, because that's a really good time to consider duplication. Right. Because that is usually the first thing that happens, and that's prior to it starting to distort. Um, cellulose acetate has a really quirky way of distorting, where it, it gets this um, thing called channeling, where the emulsion and the acetate are expanding and contracting, and the acetate is losing plasticizers at a different rate than the emulsion. So you get almost these creases. And there's some good pictures of this on the website, that Park Service website. So the creases where the, the acetate is bubbling up almost um, make it really hard to get a good scan, um, especially in transmitted light if it's a negative, because you have all these lines that are running through your image. So if you get your scanning done before it gets to that point, um, you're going to achieve a lot better you know, results in that. Right. So I guess also lesson learned that you shouldn't right. with your, your collections language check on them right. frequently, even if you feel like they're rehoused appropriately. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So um, well, Debbie's asked a, 
Debbie Rossi in Shelton, Connecticut, has asked a question that actually I had as well. I mean, I think one of the greatest parts of the website is it shows how much you can achieve with just a commercially available home type freezer. Mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. especially for some of the institutions who you know benefit or we want to have, have benefit from the Connecting the Collections online community, um, ex pretty expensive specialized pieces of equipment may be without their reach. But you know, for several hundred dollars, you know, a home freezer could actually um, do quite a lot for your collection. And um, Debbie was specifically saying, "Is it cold enough for for nitrate?" And you had sort of referenced that before. N not quite. Um, yes. Well, it is. Um, a freezer is uh, any home freezer, and that's actually what we use for the Park Service. Um, and we have used them in a number of different sites for. Exactly some of the reasons that you just went through, Kristen. It's you know it's very expensive. Um, we have almost 400 different locations with collections. Um, some just don't have the space or the staff, as I'm sure a lot of you can understand, time <laughs> to work on this. And so, just obtaining you know one freezer usually you know people have enough space for that. Um, and certainly, just the top of a, a home freezer unit, if that's all the space that you need, that's just fine. Um, the only thing, Debbie, with your question is, um, I really wouldn't recommend that for nitrate, um, because it would be more of the cellulose acetate, um, because cellulose nitrate really needs what's called a flammable storage freezer, because of that flammability issue I talked about before. Um, but certainly, if, if they're on the edge of deteriorating and you're trying to make a game plan, um, it's better for them to be frozen, um, even though they won't strictly be following um, fire code. And that's the problem you get into with um, museum environments and storing cellulose nitrate films. There are certain fire codes that need to be followed. Um, so that, you know, if you have a bunch of those, that needs to be thought about and taken care of. But um, on the website, there's a lot of references to what to look for in a home freezer. Um, you know, uh, frost-free is definitely recommended. Um, many of the freezers that we've purchased from the Park Service are just, I don't know if I can give a name brand here, but you know, Sears, whatever. <laughs> um, Sears freezers, just a regular freezer does just fine um, if you follow the normal um, and outlined packaging procedures that are on the website. Okay, great. And uh, yeah, we were joking before, but uh, no, you could not put your lunch or your <laughs> in there too. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Kristen and I were talking about that prior to the call, and that actually is a good point because if you have a lot of different people in and out of that area, it's going to be tempting <laughs> to want to do that. And um, so one of the things that we have on the website in our little list of things to look for is um, uh, locking. It has a freezer that has a lock on the outside. So, um, and a lot of them do come with that. So you can prevent the lunch situation from happening. And I suppose that's also good just for the security of the collection as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And so makes, yeah, and I guess you're trying to keep the, con the condition inside the freezer as stable as well. Right. When people are popping open the door a lot. Right. You're not, right. you're not achieving that. Um, that's just getting into another area. And um, we might be you know, crossing into the issues of wrapping here. But we, we can just see. But she's just saying, what's the best way to control humidity if we're using like a restaurant or home style freezer? Um, and she's asking about trays of silica. Um, well, that's. Um, that's a good question. And you really, what you want to do is we're not going to try to c control the humidity in the freezer itself because we realize it's going to do what it does, especially if it's uh, frost-free. Um, you know, as it goes through that defrost cycle, it will cycle up. And we did testing um, for this when we were looking at our freezers for the Park Service that normally a standard household freezer might be about 60, 65% RH. But then when it goes through the defrost, it can go up to about 95, just for a little while, like for a few hours as it's going through the defrost cycle. So because of that, and we know we can't control that, that is why we do the packaging that we do, the vapor-proof packaging. And when we package the items, because we're trying to keep them very airtight and vapor-proof, we make sure the room that we're packaging in 
has an acceptable RH, an RH that we're okay with. And we monitor the RH inside the packages with little um, humidity cards that we put inside the packaging to make sure that the boxes are maintaining the RH that we packaged in. And we did some initial uh, testing on that just to make sure they were as vapor-proof as we thought they were and put Hobo data loggers inside the packages and then data loggers just inside the freezer itself. And we noticed as the freezer went up and down like crazy throughout the day, the packages that were packaged properly only saw maybe a 1% change in RH, where the RH change outside the packages in the freezer could be 30%, 40%. So the packaging really did a good job of maintaining a microclimate, which is what we're really trying to do with that packaging design to create a stable microclimate inside there that you can peek in and look at when you open your freezer door by looking at the little humidity cards that you can read um, through the packaging. Thanks, that's great. Um, sure. So, so why don't we go through those packaging steps because I mean, the, the site does a great job. So if, mm -hmm. if any of you have not looked at the, the, that video yet on the site, um, I think if you're intimidated by this idea of packaging, you, you will get all your step-by-step -step instructions from <laughs> lovely Teresa and her sister. Um, so, but do you want to just exactly? If you want to just uh, go through them quickly, um, sure. I mean, you're not talking. I mean, you wrap each photo, you know, each piece of film individually. I mean, you group them. So, I mean, maybe just go through that quickly. Yeah, sure. Um, a lot of times, um, for example, say you have four by five negatives. Um, a lot of museums are, have those, or you have slides in binder boxes. Um, you can wrap right in the, the storage box that it's already in. Um, that's absolutely fine. Um, one of the things that we do prior to wrapping is fill out any empty space in the box. Um, that will just allow for less air to be inside the box, so more likely maintain that microenvironment in there. Um, and also will allow, if you have to rearrange your boxes in the freezer and kind of tip boxes on the side, it won't um, let collections you know, shift inside the boxes. It's going to keep them nice and stable. So you just have your regular box with your label on the outside. And the first thing that we do is put a humidity card on our box. That's our inner humidity card. And then the first layer, the bagging system is a two-layer bagging system. Uh, the inner box is what's called um, an anti-static shield bag. Um, it's a vapor-proof bag, um, similar in properties to things like Marvel Seal. Um, I'm, a lot of museum people use Marvel Seal. It's, a, it's a aluminum and plastic material that can be used to isolate things like uh, wooden shelving that you wouldn't want to off-gas onto collections. Um, so you have this semi-transparent vapor-proof bag that you wrap on the outside of your box. And there's a lot of instructions on making sure you get all the air out and proper sealing of the bag. And then you put um, another humidity card, indicator card, on the outside of that bag. And the reason we do two humidity cards is the one humidity card on the box is monitoring the inner bag. And the humidity card on the second layer is monitoring the outer bag. Um, and so if both of your humidity cards are, well, these cards read from blue to pink. I'm sure a lot of you have seen them. Um, if the whole card is pink, um, it means your humidity is way up there, you know, above 60, 70%. Ours, our humidity card ranges, I think, range from 10 to 60 or something like that on the ones that we put on our boxes. Um, so that's a danger zone. Usually after 60% is when you really start to get concerned with um, problems with humidity. Um, so the outer bag is just its an archival polyethylene bag with a Ziploc. Um, however, it's a little thicker than your normal kind of Ziploc bag. Normal Ziploc bags are the grocery store, you know, two mil. Um, this is six mil. It just gives a little more. Um, heft to the bag, a little more durability, a little more vapor proofness. And then that bag is wrapped in a similar manner and pushing the air out, taping it down, and sealing that off. 
Um, so there's some really great images of that whole process, of the video of the whole process of how to wrap. And there's a lot of little quirks that you could run into. And we even tried to put those on there. So if you have a, you know, this particular problem, uh, we have a little video of solutions for particular problems with wrapping. That's great. And so, I mean, in the Park Service, I mean, how long have you had materials roughly in, in storage? I mean, you have, do you have to ever rewrap things? Or does the plastic stay pretty staple while it's in storage? Yeah, so far, um, this project for the Park Service, we're in our fifth year. Uh -huh. And um, I just went back and revisited one of the first parks that we wrapped, which was kind of fun. And all the boxes are doing great. I haven't noticed any change. Um, and one of the things that we recommend in the video is, is doing that kind of monitoring, um, especially within the first year. Um, to go in and maybe quarterly just take a quick glance at all your little humidity cards and just see where they are. And also, when you first put your boxes in the freezer, do a recording of your baseline of where you are, uh, where all your humidities are at that point. So then you have a pretty good idea if you're seeing any change. OK. Um, and um, yeah, so far, so good. Everything has been really stable so far. So, And as you said, I mean, it seems like the, the system that you've developed in the microclimate um, concept, mm -hmm. they shouldn't have much of a problem with sort of where a box is placed within the freezer or needing to rotate them or anything like right. that. It should nope. be doing its job as a microclimate. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's great. Um, so we had a question about vacuum sealing. Mm -hmm. Would that be you, an option? You could do that to help get air out and also seal the bags. Um, the reason that we didn't do that with the Park Service is that this is a service-wide project, and we couldn't get everyone a vacuum sealer at every park. <laughs> right. And we wanted it to be easy without a lot of equipment, and just anyone could do it anywhere. Um, and some of our parks are pretty remote. Um, and so we found we, when we did experimentation with um, sealing the edge, either heat sealing it or, or vacuuming it out and sealing it, um, the effectiveness was the same. We got the same results um, no matter how we um, closed it, as long as we you know, sealed it really well and were careful. Um, it didn't seem that there was a great advantage, except for probably quickness <laughs> in terms of the, of the vacuum sealing. But for cost and um, maintaining those in all the parks was then a lot more expensive. So that's the reason we went with, um, when you watch the video, we just kind of roll the ends and tape them up. Um, so that's the reason we went that route. Great. So again, if someone has it, terrific. But mm -hmm. it's another savings in terms of absolutely the project. Time. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why I think the video is good for small institutions because it really focused on simplicity and affordability. So great, great. Um, so now we're getting into. We had some questions from um, Rukshana in Los Angeles, and you and I mm -hmm. talked about this before the webinar getting into access. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. and as we were talking, you know, it sounds like if they're the same situation in LA, you are compelled, say, by the video to get your things into cold storage. But then, you know, you always had that project. You were going to digitize all these things. And maybe mm -hmm. you haven't yet. So um, you know, how? I guess there are a couple of questions here. How do you? Prior, you know, how do you sort of plan ahead on a project like this, and then say you need to get into those boxes mm -hmm. again? Can you talk mm -hmm. us through how that's done? Sure, sure. And that, and as yeah, as Kristen and I were talking a little bit today earlier, um, this is an important topic because, of course, they're your collections, and um, access is is going to be important. Um, and a couple of things with, especially the film-based collections, is that we find with with the Park Service collections that if we have research or researchers or whatever that wants to come in, if we have print copies, that's usually fine and we never need to take the negatives out. Um, or many of the collections just aren't accessed very often. But if they are, we do encourage them to digitize them prior to cold storage. Or if they're unsure, um, it is OK to take them out a few times a year, um, not much more than that. Research that, once again, IPI did 
kind of says that if you take them out more than one or two times a year, you're, you're losing the effect of your cold storage. So what practice we've been doing in the Park Service is if you find you know, you're taking something out, take that time while it's out, if you can, to digitize it and then put it back in. Um, and then at that, many of the Park Service collections are so large, you know, they can be 20,000 objects. To take that time to digitize everything before they went in would just be more time for them outside of cold storage, um, giving them time to deteriorate. So we're kind of putting them in stasis for a while, packaging them up, putting them in stasis, and just waiting and seeing um, how much use they get in some instances if you're, if you're unsure. But certainly for high use collections, I would recommend doing some digitization before they go in. Or at least, the, as you said, at least make sure there's print access copies. Exactly. If there's a print access copy, there's you know, different ways around it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, you, and that is correct. I just noticed the bottom of her thing. It, it, it does take some time to um, unwrap. <laughs> and it does take some time to um, repackage them. So you want to think carefully. Um, you know, before you start wrapping and packing, or before you start taking things in and out, because it, it is time consuming. It you know it takes five ten minutes per box to do all the wrapping. So, right. And then, how do you? I mean, to acclimate something's been in, in a cold environment. Do you do you need to take steps to acclimate materials either in or out of cold storage? Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's one of the another one of the reasons that we do um, the packaging to prevent condensation on the film. So what we recommend is, um, and this is kind of hard sometimes because you need to think in advance a little bit, which isn't always easy. Um, you may get a researcher in there who, you know, I need things today, only have one day. And, that, and um, you're, you have to tell them, well, you have to wait, you know, five, six hours for this to come to room temperature. That can be difficult. Um, so that would be the only problem if you were limited in time. But usually we recommend if you know you want to access a certain collection, you know, the night before you leave, take the box out, let it sit out, let it just acclimate with its packaging on. Um, so it's acclimating back to room temperature very, very slowly. And then the next morning, you take that packaging off. And um, you're going to have your condensation on the outside of the plastic, but not on the film materials inside. Great. Um, well, I think another follow-up that um, Rukshana had was, you know, so this is like a long-term storage thing. But mm -hmm. it also seems to me it's, it's such an effective storage technique mm -hmm. that um, would you agree it's sort of worth people maybe upping this in their priority list of all the many collections, if they have a significant amount of film in their collections. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. know it's um, the cell cellulose acetate especially. Um, you know, so they're, they're long list of to-dos. Digitizing right. or, or putting things in a cold storage, especially since you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's relatively affordable to do. Um, what do you think is is better? Is it is it better to prioritize getting stuff into storage if you have, I guess, a decent amount of access material, or mm -hmm. is it or is it better to think about no, we just don't want to take it in and out and in and out and in and out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely think it's better. Um, yeah, to, to probably get it into storage just to have time to think. <laughs> it's going to give you that time. Um, it's almost like um, disaster response kind of theory. Freeze it and then think about it. Because you know, sometimes you just have too many things if you've ever been a disaster to, um, to, to work on at once. And um, so if you freeze it, it's going to hold it in stasis for a while. Um, so I think that's probably um, the better choice there, I would say. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really is something to think about that's going to be permanent. So it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around, um, you know, putting your collections like that. But usually we start actually with film-based materials, um, films that are right around 50 years old or so. Now, granted, there's a great variance in how they were stored in the past, but um, those are the ones that right around that time start to deteriorate. And so across the Park Service, across the board, we have a lot of films from the 40s and um, 50s. And so there's so much on that edge at once that you know, our solution 
it was just put it in cold storage and we can think about it, about a different strategy later. Because who knows later, I mean, even if you digitize now, what, what type of reproductive digital media is going to be available 20 years from now? Maybe right. something even better, you know, more archival. So maybe you wait for that. Um, it's hard to say. Right, that's true. But actually, now that you've mentioned disaster preparedness, I've got another question. Um, so, again, to the microclimate achieved by the good packing, you know, if you lose power and your mm -hmm. freezer is without power, say for the weekend, mm -hmm. um, again, will that microclimate sort of buffer you a bit in terms of something like Absolutely. That? Absolutely. It'll almost just be, I mean, it's if you have a freezer full, the thermal mass of that freezer will probably last a good long time as long as you don't open it up. Um, but also, it will allow it to slowly acclimate, just like you took it out of the freezer and put it on the, the counter for you know eight hours or overnight. Um, it's not going to be um, getting any condensation or anything, even if the freezer on side is, you know, is sweating and dripping. Um, you're, if you're packaged really well, you should be just fine. It's just going to slowly, you know, come up to, to room temperature. Right. And, and I suppose, given two scenarios, one in which your institution has not taken this step and has not put film in cold storage and they lose power for the weekend, mm -hmm. and the HVAC system in the building is way off the charts, or God forbid you're in a hurricane, Right. You know, area and you really don't have even access to your site in high humidity. Right. Um, again, I guess the cold storage is just a le another level of protection mm -hmm. against an unthinkable situation. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, it is. Um, and then a great question from, from Per Kuntis in uh, Cincinnati. So are there monitoring systems that you know that sort of alert to freezer misfunction or I mean, do you just yes. sort of Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we do have, um, there are some loggers, data loggers that you can get that um, will monitor and can alert staff um, off-site or within the building. Um, some of the freezers, even the household ones, have little alarms like door jar kind of things, which aren't great, but <laughs> they're better than nothing. But you can go from that simplistic little door jar beeper that you know your 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 temperature is too high in there to um, full out monitoring systems. Um, some of the monitoring systems though I know depending on what they are you have to drill a hole into the freezer to allow a wire to, to come out of it. Um, but I think those are even changing in terms of their technology. Okay. And so that would be something you'd buy separately from the freezer? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Glass plates are touchy, um, depending on what type of glass plates they are. Um, usually glass plates that are collodion, if you know if they're collodion versus gelatin, collodion do not do so well um, in terms of being in cold storage. Um, there's often problems in the past with the emulsion popping off when you're dealing with um, collodion materials. And also, a lot of the glass plates are black and white, and they're on glass, which in itself is, quote unquote, relatively stable. Um, so unless they're a color material, um, they're not as vulnerable as the film, because the film, it's the base itself that's the real vulnerable part, okay. um, re requiring the extreme of cold storage versus just good in museum environment. Um, so you know, glass plates do relatively well, just fine um, in terms of just you know being in your regular museum storage environment. That's great. And then up on the screen now, you can still see I have um, a link to some of the Image Permanence Institute references. This is just a handful of some of the things on their mm -hmm. website. Mm -hmm. But um, if you're you know participants who are out there, if you have questions or concerns, I mean these are very easy to use resources and we'll tell you right away that the IPI media storage quick reference, I think, and they have a, even a wheel format. Right. But we'll tell you right away what sort of things you should be thinking about. To figure yeah. Out. yeah, those are ex excellent resources. Yeah. yeah, and I think we have links to those too on through our um, 
our video and our uh, tutorial and our, and our website, too. So, um, and there's a lot of resources linked to that. Uh, we kind of tried to structure the actual um, DVD or, or online version um, with multiple layers. So we have the videos for quick overall information, and then it goes deeper into reference materials, you know, if you want to know more, and kind of just different layers of how much you want to know. Um, so there's, there's a lot there. That's great. Then does it get into um, how you can find some of the materials you've referenced, like some of the archival yes. and packaging materials? Mm -hmm. Do you have links yeah. to that as well? Yeah, there's a list of supplies and what to think about and um, what to think about when you're buying supplies. Um, we even have references, sometimes even trying to decide what size bags do I need. <laughs> um, we even have references to that, what size fits, what size box. Great. Um, all of these little things are really important <laughs> once you get into it. So we tried to cover um, from organizing your collections in terms of preparing them to go into cold storage, just in terms of getting them in boxes and getting them in some sort of outer container, um, to purchasing the materials, to wrapping, and monitoring and access. So all those different um, subjects are covered in the tutorial. Great. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really... A, can't say enough about the site. It's, it's really useful. And you, you also referenced it is available as a DVD. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And mm -hmm. Ordering information on that same flash site, or is that something we should put up out on our? Um, that's actually we we do have some here that would be available to institutions um, that we can send you if you would like a copy. Um, you can just um, email me or call me. Um, and I can see if I can get you a copy on that. There's no, there's no charge for the DVD. Okay, great. Well, we might just um, put up your, your email address here on the chat. Absolutely. We don't mind. Um, no, nope, absolutely. And while we're doing that, um, I guess back to um, the emergency situation. If the power goes out or you're, whatever, for whatever reason you have a freezer malfunction, do you need to repackage? I mean, you talked about how the condensation is. Mm -hmm is trapped between the outermost layer and the innermost layer of plastic. Um, actually, that? actually, it won't be trapped between the two layers. It'll, oh, okay. be, it'll be on the outside of the, oh, okay. of the okay. outer plastic. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, sure, sure. And yeah, if it is trapped, then you have a problem with your outer bag, and you need to replace your outer bag. Um, so no, you wouldn't have to. Um, your humidity cards that are on, attached to your bags inside will tell you if something had gone wrong. If I, I don't know why it would go wrong right at that point, but if it did and your humidity cards are all pink or say above 60%, um, then sure, you'd want to repackage, but it shouldn't um, because the packaging's not really seeing that. So you may need to um, you know, take a towel and just wipe off the condensation on the outside of the boxes, but other than that, I think you'd be okay. Okay, then go right back in the freezer. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And I see a question, another question from Debbie about cased images, um, tin types and daguerreotypes. Um, those you also wouldn't want to freeze, um, kind of for multiple multitude of reasons. But some of the same reasons does been neck tape because you're you're dealing with um, if things are cased, you know, plastic or leather, um, glass and metal, and then the, you know the photograph itself. So you're dealing with a lot of different materials expanding and attracting at different points. And that's where you can kind of get in trouble in the frozen state. Um, so I wouldn't really freeze um, cased images like tin types or daguerreotypes. OK, thanks. But you know, it, that brought to mind the issue with slides. So slides are cased in you know, some type of a cardboard type material mm -hmm. or in plastic sometimes, too. Is that an issue? No, no, that doesn't, it's not an issue. The film, in that case, the film itself is exposed. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, um, well, especially with the paper ones, the paper is fine, because often we have, our enclosures are paper. And paper is just going to expand and contract and let off some moisture, um, you know, as, as humidity changes in the environment. Um, but even in the plastic ones, there is, Space if, if the you know if the plastic of the little slide itself needed to move, but no, it doesn't seem to be any issue um, with slides. Even with slides that are in um, 
plastic sleeves themselves in binders or in those binder kind of boxes that you can, archival boxes that you can buy. Right. Um, they seem to do just fine um, in that case. OK, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I suppose in, in even those plastic slide holders, it's really the film is sort of floating in there. It's not exactly really attached. Exactly. Exactly. Way, so. Exactly. OK, great. Um, I'm trying to think, are there other, are there other points that, that you know are kind of common questions you've gotten as you've visited the parks, or, or sort of any troubleshooting or, you know, that you've um, had to work on? Well, I think um, the most concern, I think, is the access question that seems to be the most common thing. And I think the, the part that sometimes takes the longest, uh, once you get down to the packaging, it's not so bad. But just preparing it takes a long time. And I understand you know, in small institutions, the number of people working on your site is limited. Um, so you know, you're going to have to make a you know, list of what's going into cold storage, um, list of things that you may need to access, what is where. Um, you know, often what we'll do suggest and that's just one thing on the, the website that we show, is making a map of your freezer of what box is on what shelf. And that's, and that's a really nice thing to do to help you keep track of what is where. And so when you open that up, you're not standing there for a long time, like when you're trying to decide what to make for dinner, <laughs> with the freezer door open. Um, and you can you know, quickly know exactly where that box is. Um, so any issues, I think, involving access because you know we understand it's, it's it's I think some of the parks feared when we came around with this whole storage issue that we were saying that's the end of your contact with those collections and that's not what we were trying to do um, so you, you can still access them just more on a limited basis and so actually that brings up a point about labeling those boxes before you put them in there I mean you can pretty much see through the plastic so you can like exactly. label the box itself. Exactly. But and you shouldn't use any kind of adhesive label or anything like that, I'm assuming. Um, you can use adhesive labels or write in um, like uh, black um, India ink or something. Because the uh, vapor-proof bag, the inner bag, is only semi-transparent. It's not completely transparent like a regular polyethylene zip black bag. Um, and one of the reasons we chose the one that we did are other barrier films that are similar to it are completely opaque. So that's an issue because you can't see the boxes at all. And even if you could put a label between the two layers of bags, there's something really, <laughs> I don't know, something really wrong about not being able to see your boxes that makes us nervous. Um, <laughs> Um, so that um, accessibility, just to be able to visually see your labels, um, whatever they may be, um, through that semi-transparent uh, vapor-proof bag is, is a really nice and, you know, thing. Um, because otherwise, you just have that urge, like, what is going on under that inner bag? So um, yeah. OK. Um, another question coming in on sort of appropriate of this technique for different kinds of material. Mm -hmm. So um, what about motion picture film? You know, mm -hmm. Does it matter if it's color, black and white, acetate, polyester? Do you leave everything on the metal reels? Mm -hmm. um, yes, it is appropriate for motion picture film. And yes, we found that it's fine to leave it on the metal reels um, as long as they're not rusted. Um, you can even use your older um, film cans to package them in as long as they're not rusted. They do just fine. Um, and I see she says, apply equally to color, black and white, acetate, polyester. Um, yes and no to that. Applies equally to color. Um, color in all instances, yes, no matter what the film base, even if it's polyester. If it's color, you're going to get fading. Um, black and white, you don't have to worry about the polyesters, um, just the acetate, acetates. If you have black and white and polyester, you have two very stable things. And those two things in combination only require um, just normal archival conditions. Right. And that's, again, I'll just plug the IPI media storage guide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you've got limited time to do this kind of packaging. Obviously, the supplies cost something. You might maybe have limited room in your freezer. So it's good to, to sort of right. have a handle on what really is going to benefit from cold storage so you can prioritize right. accurately. Right. 
Um, so let's see, we also have a question about negatives in sleeves, and then also um, and then nitrate negatives in sleeves, and then but also just some more information about the sort of archival materials and plastic pages. So I'm assuming that you want your your any kind of plastic sleeve or plastic pages to be, you know, the highest quality, um, archivally safe polyethylene type of material to begin with. Right. If if you can, and you're doing your your um, film-based media is not housed currently, then sure, choose the best quality materials you can. And plastic is fine. Plastic or paper is fine. Um, but truth be told, for the, for the park service, we had so many that were already rehoused. And like I said, I don't have to bring this up again, but sometimes there's you know 10,000 uh, in clay paper enclosures, let's say, that may be slightly acidic because they've been in those same enclosures for 25 years. Well, we don't have the staff to rehouse all of those. And if we did have the staff to rehouse all of those, it would probably still take a year and a half to rehouse all of those. So talking with various photo conservators about this, we all kind of agreed that you know, when we put something in cold storage, not only is it slowing down the deterioration of the media itself, but it's also slowing down deterioration of everything else. So your acidic envelopes aren't going to have the same effect as they once did in just normal storage conditions. Um, so oftentimes we will just, if we have a whole box that are in you know, semi-acidic envelopes, we'll just package them that way um, to get them frozen and get that deterioration slowed down in terms of everything, every type of material that's going in there. Great. So again, another, another way to prioritize Mm -hmm. When money is in short supply, sure. time is in short supply. Sure, you don't have to rehouse everything if you, okay. you just don't, because everything is going to slow down um, at that point. And I saw someone asked a question about nitrate negatives individually housed. Um, sure, nitrate negatives can be housed the same way as cellulose acetate negatives. Um, they will still deteriorate, but much more slowly, so the off-gassing will be much slower. Um, but once again, the nitrate negatives need special storage freezers. Great. And let's see, Dan, did you said, um, OK, so just more questions about the storage uh, materials. Yeah, if, you've had, if, you're, if you're just rehousing, yeah, it's, it's best to go ahead and use some good quality plastic sleeves. And the sleeves are fine. It doesn't seem to have any problem because you have your microclimate in there with condensation on the plastic between the plastic and the slides or anything like that. Great. Well, everyone, we're in our last three minutes. So if you had a burning question, this is a good time to type it out. Um, and as we mentioned, this, this whole um, webinar has been recorded. And we will get it up on the Connecting to Collections online community site. Um, maybe today, um, if not very soon, in the next few days. So if you, if you have someone, a colleague, or, or someone you think might benefit from this information, please feel free to point them to the site. And then again, um, I'll put the slide back up. The um, resource itself is here, and it'll be a link to it will be up on the online community for an, another couple weeks. But certainly anything we feature on the online community site, we archive. And there is a, a link on the topics menu to care photographs. And so you'll get uh, references to this, as well as a link back to this, this recorded webinar and some other resources that we've come across, like some IPI materials and, and yet even still more more links. So um, feel free to refer people to that as well. And then I did want to say, um, in, in looking for a conservator, the American Institute for the Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works is a great resource. Just on their home page, they have a Find a Conservator link. And they can connect you with a um, photo conservator in your part of the country. And that's just a great way if you've got additional or very specific questions, if you need some consultation on how to handle a restorage project at your institution, um, it's great to, to, to have a conservator you know, become, um, come to your institution or understand your specific issues that you, that you might have questions about before you undergo any, any major project like this. Uh, we had a question from Holly in Chicago. Um, should you separate different types of film, especially nitrate, from other types of film when you're packaging them up? 
Um, um, nitrate. Yeah, Holly, definitely the nitrates if you can. I know it's hard sometimes to do ID on everything, but um, the nitrates would need those different freezers. So um, you don't have to worry about most of your films, which are slides and, and negatives and stuff, which are most likely cellulose acetate after a certain year. Um, that's fine um, to have them in the same boxes. But the nitrates have a little different requirements, so those would need to be separated out if you can. But what about other types of films? I mean, is um, it in the box, or is it preferable to, to kind of keep them segregated? Um, it's, and for other types of films, so there's only really only two other types of film bases besides the nitrate, the cellulose acetate, and polyester. Mm -hmm. And you'd only be putting the polyester in there if it's color. Um, and it's fine if it's color polyester film, no matter what it is, from 35 millimeter film to slides to whatever, if you had you know, different sizes of, of negatives in one box or something like that, that's just fine. Okay, so even, yeah, mm -hmm. even a set of slides or sure. negative sure. effect. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, chances are people are, have, if they have a, a quantity of these kinds of materials, they'll need it. Absolutely, you see a full enough binder box of slides or, yeah, yeah. definitely, yeah. definitely. But, yeah, it's fine to, to store the different types of media together. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, well, um, I've put up on this page that we are doing an evaluation. Um, and my understanding is you should be able to link, click on this link. Um, Mike, tell me if I'm wrong about that. At the very least, you can um, cut and paste this into your web browser. Um, but we'd really appreciate any feedback you had on this webinar, especially as we plan other ones. And we have an opportunity for you to uh, nominate topics that we might be able to tackle. Um, through these types of webinars, uh, it's just a great opportunity to give you very quick and easy access to some of the great preservation um, experts around the country that Heritage Preservation is fortunate enough to interact with on a daily basis, and we can make them accessible to you all as well. So we, we hope these are useful for you, um, but we'd love to have your feedback on it. So um, I think we're just about at 3 o'clock. So, Teresa, I just want to again thank you for your help and for all of this information and also to the Park Service for, for making this excellent web um, video series available to the rest of the country because all of the research you did and, and the firsthand experience that you had is uh, really a great thing for us all to benefit from. So thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. And it was a lot of fun. I was glad to do this. and. Um, you know, feel free to check out the site and also other NPS resources like um, NPS conservagrams, which are also online. And we wrote three of them for this project in particular. Um, and anyone can feel free to contact me with questions um, on, you know, further questions after this, this webinar. I'm more than happy to, to assist. Um, so thank you very much for all and who joined today. Yeah, thanks. And um, I did put up your, your email address in the chat. And, uh, and also, if there are other questions, that if you think of one later on, you can always go to the Connecting to Collections online community and just post it as a discussion topic. And um, we'll, we'll track down Teresa or some other expert and uh, help you out. So thanks, everyone, for participating. And I hope you stay cool and have a great afternoon.